This is Fortress on a Hill with Henry, Danny, Kagan, Giovanni, Shiloh, and Manisha. Welcome, everyone, uh, to Fortress on a Hill, a podcast about U.S. foreign policy, anti-imperialism, hypnotism, and the American way of war. I'm Giovanni. Thank you for being with us today. Today, I'll be flying solo, and I want to talk about diplomacy. So war is a failure of diplomacy. This was said by Michigan Representative John Dingler. Uh, and indeed, so far in, in this 21st century has been a century of global war with one diplomatic blunder after another. At least six countries have been destroyed in this century, with millions dead and tens of millions displaced as a result of it. You were born in 2001. There hasn't been a single day that U.S. has not either been involved in a war directly, indirectly, or is conducting a war by proxy or by other means. Destabilizing and instigating, starting fires, different regions across the world, and then pouring kerosene on it. But the background, but in the background of all of this, there's an arm industry that is, that is maximizing wealth. Indeed, the shares of Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, Boeing, Northern, Grubin, Grubin, and General Dynamics have been doing well for this past year. Uh, but war is also politics by other means. This was according to Clausewitz. And, and war is politics by, uh, with bloodshed, according to Mao Zedong. What has happened to American diplomacy? Why is the American leadership so quick to incite or take us to war? Why does every president since Bush feel the need to be a wartime president and present themselves as one during an electoral campaign trail. Here to tell us more, we're joined by Colonel Ann Wright. In her 29-year career in the Army and Army Reserve, Colonel Ann Wright served at the NATO Subcommand Allied Forces Central Europe, a, and later as a diplomat serving in the U.S. Embassy in Nicaragua, Grenada, Somalia, Kyrgyzstan, Sierra Leone, Micronesia, Afghanistan, and Mongolia. She resigned from the U.S. government in March, 20, in March 2003 in opposition to Bush's war on Iraq. She is an advisory, advisory board member for, for Veterans for Peace, International Peace Bureau, War Beyond War, Gaza Freedom, Flotilla, uh, no, no to NATO, Hawaii Peace and Justice, Pacific Peace Network, Women Cross the DMZ, and Campaign for peace, this disarmament, and common security. Colonel, how are you doing today? Well, I'm I'm actually not doing so well because of the state of the world, where we have the U.S. involved directly in two conflicts of in Ukraine, <clears throat> Ukraine and Gaza. Uh, we have U.S. troops in Syria, Iraq, Philippines, South Korea, Japan. Um, here in Hawaii, where I live, is one of the most militarized states in the island of Oahu, one of the most militarized islands in the world. So um, it's, a, it's a tough world when you're trying to have peace, and yet, as you have so um, rightfully identified, the history of the United States uh, is pretty sordid in terms of using war rather than diplomacy to resolve international issues. Absolutely, yes. Um, so let me ask you something. So what happened to the days, uh, you're a diplomat uh, um, in your career, and what happened to the days of the Kennedy team, for example, doing backroom diplomacy with Khrushchev to avoid a nuclear confrontation with the USSR, or Reagan engaging with Gorbachev to achieve armed control in Europe with the Intermediate Range Nuclear Tre uh, Force Treaty? Why are we getting... Uh, egomaniacs like Cheney, Rumsfeld, Trump, Bolton, buffoons like Nikki Haley, Bill uh, Blinken, uh, mediocre president, uh, medi mediocre presidents like Bush, Biden, and grifters like Obama. What what is happening to American diplomacy? Well, first, what's happening to the American electorate that elects these people? <laughs> and uh, here we are coming upon an, another presidential election. And it's up to the, the citizens of our country to ask the hard questions to these candidates about what they're going to do for peace in the world. Or are they going to continue this uh, never-ending giveaway to the weapons industries, if you, as you've mentioned? Um, and in fact, we do have a, a tribunal that's going on right now called Merchants of War 
uh, which is really, really an interesting one where we uh, we have collected the evidence against these uh, big corporations and what they are doing to people all around the world, you know, getting paid for by our U.S. tax money, uh, creating these weapons that kill people everywhere. Uh, as far as the politicians, we elect them and we've elected some doozies. And that was when I was in the U.S. government and both in the army and in the diplomatic corps. I mean, you're really at the mercy of of who gets elected in the United States, who becomes president and what uh, what their policies uh, are. And they've been pretty consistently war over diplomacy. I will. The one thing I'll give President Trump credit for, and this is about the only one, is that he did actually use diplomacy with North Korea. And we almost, almost came to an agreement of some sort uh, with the North Koreans um, until a warmonger, John Bolton, stuck his nose into it and blew the whole thing up. But Trump did have three meetings with Kim Jong-un, and I, one would hope that Biden would have uh, picked up on, on that. Um, we would have hoped that Biden would have continued the work that was done under the Obama administration, when he was vice president, for God's sakes, for eight years, who was vice president with Obama, and that's when we had the deal with the Iranians on, on the nuclear program that they have, not going into nuclear weapons, which it still hasn't. But it's not because uh, of anything the U.S. has done after Trump blew that um, that agreement up, uh, and Biden has not roll back the sanctions that the Trump administration put in on Cuba. There's so many things that that uh, Biden has left in place that it's almost like uh, Biden is Trump's poodle, lap dog on so many issues that this should have been changed on the first day that Biden came into power. So it is up to us as the the citizenry to pin down these politicians on what their beliefs are and recognize that we're going to get lied to, that's for sure, but then to try to hold them accountable in some way as this lying is going on. And that's where you see now the huge, huge demonstrations that are going on all over the country about uh, the Biden administration uh, uh, supporting every criminal act that the state of Israel is doing on Gaza and the West Bank. So why is that? Because you mentioned that it's up to the electorate. I mean, the last electoral cycle, uh, foreign policy hardly even come up. I'm not doing a lot of activism nowadays, but when I were um, in the streets, uh, there seemed to be not a lot of interest of what's happening abroad. We were like doing the the uh, uh, marches or doing the the rallies for Black Lives Matter, for example. We get like a amount of people on the streets, right? But when Trump assassinated Soleimani, for example, we tried to do a rally. Uh, we only get like 40 people show up. So it seems like to be not to be an interest in, in what happens in, in foreign policy and in the street. Uh, I also wanted to ask you, you mentioned about Obama, you know, when he did the nuclear uh, deal with Iran, for example, and then... Uh, Trump comes into office and and just dismantle it. You know how flimsy are these are these uh, treaties that these presidents make, where it's so easy for the next president just just to tear it up. I mean, I just mentioned you what happened with uh, Reagan, for example, and his arms control with uh, Gorbachev, and that arms control in Europe stood for for a few decades until until it was undone by Trump, I believe. Right? Um, either Bush well, or Trump. Uh, it was Biden. actually Bush. Bush, Bush one or Bush two started dismantling the uh, ABM treaty and uh, coming out of all the arms control uh, treaties, including Trump following in with with his late his uh, coming out. Uh, but you're exactly right. I mean, how uh, first the American public is not interested in foreign affairs until their kids get sent into it with a war. And then that, then they perk up their interest. It, interestingly enough, U.S. U.S. citizens have not been involved in Gaza, although there are there are Palestinian Americans that are in in Gaza. Um, but this this particular one with the Israeli Americans too in Gaza. And, yes, you're right, absolutely. 
In fact, half of Israel is Americans, it seems like. <laughs> and most of the, the extremist settlers are, are Americans, Israeli Americans. So you're, you're exactly right. Jacob, and, Jacob from Brooklyn. And from Brooklyn, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it, it isn't until the U.S. Uh, uh, has kind of skin in the game that, that people become interested. And it's not, it's not to try to prevent it to raise your voices before the U.S. gets involved in these military uh, conflicts. Um, it's after after the, the horse is out of the barn, so to speak. So it's, it's really important, though, that we, during the campaign, whenever there are town hall meetings or uh, any opportunity to, to be near the politicians or their staff, is to keep pounding on these foreign affairs questions because it's, you know, when we look at how much tax money, of course, this is, is spent uh, on weapons and the U.S. military versus you know, the social programs that we should be having in education and health and infrastructure and things like that, you know, it's over over 50 percent of our tax money goes to to war and the military. So. It's in our best interest to to talk about that and try to get the politicians to talk about it and then try in whatever way we can to hold them accountable for uh, for they're not following through on programs that we hope will will emphasize more the the education, health and things like that of our own people, plus the, the health of people around the world so that they don't die when the U.S. starts doing military operations on them. Right, absolutely, and and it's interesting you uh, mentioned uh, the because these wars, right, these conflicts, and you know, they're they keep getting more and more. Like it's like I said earlier, right, you know, since this century has started, been in 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 a, in a vicious circle of, of conflict, one after the other, and then you forget. I, my, I was talking to my son earlier today. He said he he we're talking we're listening to a podcast and about Gaza. And he was asking me what's going on. And then he mentioned that, you know, no one's talking about Ukraine. Ukraine tends to be like old news here and in, in the media, but it's still going. It seems like old news before, like, the, that was like the last ray, right? That was like, that's like the last thing I brain. Uh, but now, guys, like, people just moved on to the next topic. Uh, meanwhile, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, our, of course, among us, you know, have to suffer with austerity. You know, they get... Uh, cuts in social spending, cuts in this. Here where I'm at, they just closed down several schools um, because of cuts. And, and people just don't seem to put two and two together because as the spending rises, I mean, we just rushed about, a, what, $120 billion to, to Ukraine, like in two years. So like in two years, we've been, we've been keeping that war in, in life support, uh, pretty much. Uh, the war could have ended a long time ago, but we've just been keeping it on life support. And then we just recently rushed another $100 billion to Israel while the people that I see in corners asking for one is and, and the lights, you know, keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So, you know, what's going on here? When you start having so many wars that you forget about one because there's a new one, uh, it's a sad state of affairs when that happens. And when there are people still being killed in Ukraine and in Russia uh, from that conflict, and when we know that the United States uh, was the one that torpedoed the peace talks uh, that were going on. German Chancellor Schroeder was having negotiations with the Ukrainians and the Russians. And finally, the Ukrainians said, the U.S. won't let us um, work on peace. And then the, for the former prime minister of Israel also had some negotiations with, with the Russians and the Ukrainians. And the same thing happened. The United States and the U.K. torpedoed those peace talks. So it's it. There's no doubt the United States definitely wants to put as much pressure, military pressure on Russia, and I guess try to bring them to their knees as the Soviet Union was done when it overspent. But the Russian Federation is a whole different um, organization. Uh, it is a commercial business. It's not a communist business anymore. It's it's got plenty of money, and, and there's no way in the world the U.S. should be trying to destroy another country. Uh, and this whole idea that, that the U.S. will sacrifice the lives of so many Ukrainians 
and the ground of, of Ukraine to try to get after Putin and Russia when uh, Russia had been telling the U.S. and NATO for decades, you know, the red line for our national security of the Russian Federation is Ukraine. And Ukraine joining NATO is one of the things that just is not, it doesn't work for our national security. So please don't do this. And of course, the U.S. kept going after it, going after it, provoking uh, the Russian Federation and uh, sending U.S. Uh, military special forces into Ukraine to help the Ukrainians uh, in the Donbass region, the Russian speaking area of Ukraine. Uh, and in a war that started in 2014 when the United States helped overthrow the elected government of Ukraine. So the U.S. Uh, has, uh, has bloody hands on so much of the, the conflict and the chaos that's in the world today. Uh, the same thing for Gaza, the never-ending total support for the state of Israel, no matter what it does to the Palestinians is terrible for our own national security. I can only imagine that after what all's gone on in Gaza and now in the West Bank, uh, that, you know, if you think 9-11 was bad, I can I would think that there are a lot of people around the world that are saying the U.S. needs to have a little dose of its own medicine. And karma, karma is not easy when you're, when you are killing people around the world. So, for our own national security and and the safety of people in the United States, the U.S. needs to back off this blind uh, support for whatever the state of Israel does to the Palestinians. Absolutely. So, oh, let me get to the Gaza because I also want to talk about your declaration at the uh, uh, United Nations recently. Uh, but first, let's talk about a little bit about your diplomatic career and and how did you switch from being a diplomat for the state um, and to become a for people to people diplomacy, a diplomat for peace. Uh. Yeah, well, I, I first uh, was in the U.S. military. I joined the Army right after college. Uh, it wasn't that I was, I came from a military family or I wanted to be a part of the war on Vietnam. What I wanted to do is to get the hell out of the state of Arkansas where I grew up. <laughs> so that's like so many young people getting out of something, leaving home, trying to get educational benefits, uh, things like that are important. It's not that uh, one generally joins because you really firmly believe in the foreign policies of the United States. Although after 9-11, there were a lot of people that joined up because the U.S. had been attacked and they wanted to be a part of pushing back on that. My first career I had was with the U.S. military. And the, the reason I stayed in was that I always, I was very lucky. I had, I had good leaders. Uh, I didn't have sexual harassment and I didn't, I was never sexually assaulted in the, in the military, which during that period, which was less than 1% of the U.S. Army were, were women back in the 1960s. So I was a very lucky person. Um, very few of the people I started out with and and the army stayed for a full career. Um, I ended up um, uh, getting off active duty to join the State Department after I had had an assignment uh, at the U.S. Southern Command and had worked a lot with uh, U.S. embassies in Central and South America. And I thought that that was a very interesting uh, career, or that was a very interesting way to work uh, on foreign policy. And at that point, I was a senior lieutenant colonel. So a lot of my friends were aghast, saying, you're, you're going to get out of the active army, go into the reserves, and join up with the State Department as kind of a second lieutenant diplomat. Jeez, you're, you're too old for that. But it was like, yeah, I'm getting old. And quite honestly, that PT at four in the morning, it was like, oh, God. And I knew diplomats didn't do that. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't working for you, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. My feet and my legs had already given out. But anyway, so I joined up um, with the State Department in 1987 and ended up, um, as you mentioned, I was in U.S. embassies in 
Nicaragua, Grenada, Somalia, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Sierra Leone, Micronesia. I helped reopen the U.S. Embassy in Kabul, Afghanistan in December of 2001 and stayed there for about six months and then went on to what turned out to be my final assignment, which was the deputy ambassador in Mongolia. And it was there in March of 2003 that I resigned from the government in opposition to that pending war, it was an imminent war that the Bush administration was going to do on Iraq. And I became the third U.S. diplomat to resign in opposition to the war on Iraq. And so for I've, I've been resigned from the government for 20 years now and have been working with the various groups, as, as you mentioned in that introduction, to say that war is not the answer and that uh, diplomacy, citizen to citizen diplomacy uh, and government to government diplomacy is the way to m resolve the issues of, of our world. And you'd mentioned um, the UN Security Council. Well, I was invited to be a briefer at a committee hearing of the UN Security Council. And this committee was on weapons transfers and particularly on weapons transfers to Ukraine. I ended up getting an invitation to speak based on my military career and my State Department career. If you ever get an invitation, jump at it. And so here I was sitting at the horseshoe table that you see at the UN Security Council. It was eerie of like, I'm sitting here with the permanent members of the Security Council and the 10 uh, temporary members that are through this session, and and I get to speak. So trying to figure out what, uh, how much you can say, um, and the whole issue of weapons transfers, of course, uh, weapons transfers make sure that wars continue. So that was my my theme essentially that uh, the the U.S. was transferring weapons, huge amounts of weapons into Ukraine. So that war would continue. And if you ever want the wars to stop, you've got to stop transferring weapons in. And the same for the Russians. The Russians uh, have had mostly their own domestic um, weapons productions. But uh, in the late and, you know, the last two months, there have been uh, articles about North Korea providing weapons to Russia. And no doubt that they are purchasing some on the international market, too. My my main argument was. Wars will continue. Conflicts will continue as long as these weapons transfers go on. And I took the opportunity to say the U.S. is involved in two major conflicts right now, the one in Ukraine and Russia and the one with Israel and Gaza. Yeah, let me uh, load a clip for us to hear. To be able to speak today on my concern about the issue of, of weapons in conflict areas, Ukraine for sure, and other areas of the world. I myself was in the U.S. military for 29 years. I retired as a colonel. I taught the law of land warfare and Geneva Conventions at the JFK Center for uh, Land Warfare, Special Warfare Center at Fort Bragg. I was in the U.S. Army during the U.S. wars on Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Grenada, Panama, and the Central American Wars in El Salvador, Honduras, and Panama. Nicaragua. I was also a U.S. diplomat for 16 years and served in U.S. embassies in Nicaragua, Grenada, Somalia, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Sierra Leone, Micronesia, Afghanistan, and Mongolia. I helped reopen the U.S. embassy in Afghanistan in December of 2001. Uh, I, I was a part of the United Nations uh, uh, operation in Somalia in 1993 and 94. I was the head of the Justice Division for UNISOM for almost six months, where we tried to recreate the Somali police judicial system and prison system. Uh, 20 years ago, I resigned from the federal government in opposition to the war on Iraq. Uh, since then, I've been working with groups around the world to say that uh, war is not the answer, that we've got to use diplomacy, that we've got to stop killing people and uh, uh, work to control weapons. Um, I recounted my history, uh, the unfortunate famili familiarity conflict areas in many regions of the world, and our challenge on reliance of many countries, including my own country, the United States, on military action instead of diplomacy to resolve 
<coughs> disagreements and conflicts. As a retired colonel and a former diplomat, I speak on my own behalf, but as a concerned citizen who, as a taxpayer, pays for the weapons my country uses and sells to fuel wars that kill innocent civilians. And I thank very much the deputy to the high representative for disarmament affairs for your uh, noting, of course, that it's civilian casualties. It's the need that we have for protecting civilians in these conflict areas. Um, there's no doubt that the weapons supplied into conflict areas have, uh, to say generously, a detrimental effect on the prospect for settlement of these conflicts. In fact, the continued supply of weapons will prolong any conflict. So the important question, I think, for the Security Council is how do you get the conflicts to end? Well, we know in this institution particularly, it is very well known within your, your halls, the process for getting to resolution of conflict is long and many people are killed until there's an agreement for a ceasefire as a first step. Now, I'd just like to do a little history of uh, how long these agreements may take us to get to where no more people are killed. The three-year Korean War from 1950 to 1953, it took uh, the, the discussions for cease firing began in 1951 and finally concluded after 575 meetings in 1953. But during that time, over 4 million Koreans, 500,000 Chinese, 35,000 U.S. and tens of thousands that were in the U.N. military command were killed. Right now, the United States is providing weapons in two conflicts, the Ukraine-Russia conflict and Israel-Gaza. Uh, we know more, much, I know much more about, because I'm American citizen and watch this stuff, uh, how much mi military equipment is being provided for, by, by my country. Uh, just uh, four or five days ago on December 7th in a press conference with uh, the UK Foreign Minister, David Cameron, uh, Secretary of State Blinken said that in the last two years, the U.S. has provided over $70 billion to support Ukraine, and European allies have provided over $110 million in weapons. Blinken said, if you look at these investments that we've made in Ukraine's defense to deal with this aggression, 90% of the security assistance we've provided has actually been spent here in the United States with our manufacturers, with our production, and that's produced more American jobs, more growth in our own economy. So this has been a win-win that we need to continue. I'll put it on the notes. So, Anne, this is what it seems to be all about. Yeah, it sure is. And uh, uh, continue, Don, I said, and the win-win is definitely not for the civilians in the area. The win-win is for the merchants of death. Uh, so... Um, it was an opportunity to uh, to give a little bit different flavor, I think, to the UN in terms of uh, really going after the weapons manufacturers and war in general. And I ended my presentation with a, a part of a poem that uh, has been written for the children of Gaza, but it's actually for the children of all conflicts. And it's, it's titled is Mama uh, Put My Name on My Leg. And it's for all the kids that over 8,000 of them have died in Gaza in two and a half months. Kids' body parts are being found. They don't know who who this little kid is or what body part. But if there's a name on a leg, that they think maybe they can they can identify it. It's just, you know, the most grotesque thing in the world that we still uh, have war as the as a at resolving problems rather than talking them out. Absolutely. But it seems so there is no no interest to talk about because it seems that there's a this disconnect between leadership, the govern and the government uh, leaders and the led uh, for at least for this Gaza, for this, you know, the ethnic cleansing. I mean, you got to call it ethnic cleansing. That's, that's what yeah. it is. The uh, genocidal war in Gaza. Uh, I believe the poll said like 60 percent of Americans are against it, you know. And that's bipartisan, Republican and Democrat. However, our leadership seems to be lockstep, you know, bipartisan. There was recently a, uh, a vote recently in the House 
uh, where they equated anti-Zionism with uh, anti-Semitic, right? And everybody voted for it. The only lonely uh, vote against this resolution was uh, a Republican congressperson, I forget his name. And then uh, Rashida Tlaib, I think she, she voted president, but she didn't vote uh, yay or nay. But everyone voted for it to equate uh, Zionism with anti-Semitism, which is two different things. But it seems like not only the leadership, the mainstream media as well, they like lockstep on, on one particular narrative, whereas the, the population are in the other direction. Well, it's, it, uh, it's true. Um, although now it seems like it's like 70% of the American public says that the genocide of Israel has to stop. And so it's uh, uh, more and more the people of the United States uh, and around the world, of course, uh, have seen what's going on. And the pressure that's been put on the Biden administration has has uh, resulted in some change in at least the the rhetoric uh, that the administration's using. They still come out totally in support of Israel because it's defending itself. But they are now at least saying that um, that Israel has to be careful for civilian casualties. Of course, Israel isn't. Um, and that the administration is talking about kind of what happens after Palestine and one of the th or what happens after the is Israeli uh, genocide stops. And they are, they're saying concepts that I don't think an American um, administration has talked about, really, about no longer having a siege on Gaza, although there's nothing left of Gaza, the rhetoric is changing um, from the administration. But unfortunately, the the actions of the Israeli government are not changing. So the the Biden administration's trying to have it both ways. They're trying to pacify the 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 U.S. public by saying we're really uh, telling the Israelis they can't kill everyone, and but Israel does have its right to defense until the last Gazan is dead, it seems like. Uh, so we we have to keep after them. I mean, in Washington, D.C., I've been in Washington for the last, in and out for the last two and a half months, and going to Congress every single day and talking to staffers, trying to catch congressmen and women in the hallways to talk about a ceasefire, having demonstrations at the White House. You know, we do know that there's there's dissension in the administration. We know that White House staffers are um, have have written a letter to Joe Biden. We know that several uh, dissent letters have been written to Tony Blinken as Secretary of State. USAID had over one thousand of its employees write uh, to the to the administrator Samantha Powers. So. Even within the government, there is a, a big split on what should be happening. And it's it, one would hope this would have resulted in the U.S. Uh, uh, not vetoing any ceasefire resolutions in the U.N., but it didn't a week and a half ago. And right now we're in the third day of, of uh, negotiations uh, where a vote on another ceasefire has not come up because the U.S. refuses to go along with a complete cessation of, of uh, military activity, uh, of Israel bombing uh, uh, Gaza. Uh, so for three days, they've been talking to the U.S. because the, the U.N. Security Council does not want to have a veto. Well, even if it passes, it doesn't mean it Israel is going to go along with whatever the ceasefire uh, go. That, that Israel has to go along with what the UN says. It's the negotiations behind the scenes between Israel, Qatar, UAE, Egypt, and the US. That's where the decision will be made whether or not there's a ceasefire. So actually the, the vote in the UN Security Council, it, it is a symbolic action and it should be taken, um, but it really is meaningless as far as what really happens on the ground in, in Gaza. I mean, there are actions that could be taken, for example, when um, going back to Gaza, um, when Riyadh had the uh, the recent meeting, uh, I believe it was two, three weeks ago, uh, oh. hold on. 
Yeah. So when, when Riyadh was having a, did a, 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 a meeting with, uh, I, think, I believe it was the Arab League and, um, and others, you know, there were suggestions to put like an oil embargo, like it was done back in 1973. Uh, and the majority of the Arab states pretty much shot it down. They won't do that. So, so there, so everyone's listening in a sideline, but, uh, no one is taking any action, just rhetoric. I mean, and one of the things that, that happened, you know, immediately after, after Israeli assault in Gaza, right, was the, uh, U.S. sending battle groups as the way to intimidate the other state from, from getting involved. What does that do? There are measures that can be taken against, against Israel, uh, that, that doesn't require a military intervention. You recall back in the, uh, the pretext for invading Iraq was because Iraq uh, violated like eight UN resolutions, right? Uh, Israel had violated like 30 of them. <laughs> there are measures that, that, that doesn't involve an armed conflict, cutting gas. I don't like to say sanctions because sanctions get weaponized, but there are measures that can, be, that, that can do that can discipline, that can hold Israel uh, accounted for, but you know, the U S and the Western states refuse to, they allow this, uh, the Zion state to, to operate with impunity. They put kids in the sand, they look the other way, they make excuses for them. Uh, uh, what does that do to the international system? Well, it means that the international system is impotent, that it doesn't do anything. It, it only does things to, to, uh, countries of color. I mean, the sanctions and all of that that go on to African countries. I mean, and the West goes right along with that. But here you have a, a European country, essentially, that happens to be in the Middle East. Uh, but nobody's taking any action. I mean, the only, it's the Hezbollah in, in Lebanon that's fired some missiles into, uh, into Israel. The Houthis all the way over in Yemen have fired some missiles. Um, that's about it. Not that I want a violent response, but this, the whole issue of, um, boycott, divestment and sanctions is very powerful. And while the governments may not take action, certainly the, the public can, I mean, there not, should not be one thing that's, that comes from the state of Israel that should be purchased by us here in the United States or in Europe. Uh, we should be going out to the airports. And for every El Al flight that flies into JFK, Newark, Boston, Los Angeles, Miami, we should be trying to get the unions, the, the airport workers unions, to not unload the baggage off those, those planes. And we should be having or asking uh, a Jewish Voice for Peace, uh, if not now, members of the Jewish community to go out and talk to all these people that are getting off the flights straight from Tel Aviv, right to those cities, and talk to them about what what is really happening. Because most of these Israeli citizens, uh, I, I fully believe, are not so aware of the level of destruction that has happened in Gaza. The reports are that Israeli TV does not cover as Al Jazeera does, and every now and then as ABC, NBC, and all of those. Um, so a lot of Israelis... Uh, don't realize what what has happened uh, in their name by their government. So whatever we can do to isolate the state of Israel, to boycott the products coming out of it, and putting a real hurt on the people of, of uh, Israel, and I would say the rest of the world ought to do the same thing to us, that we ought to be under sanctions because our government is complicit in this. And we, the citizens, if we start feeling that we're not getting, countries aren't sending things to us, we, we don't have the purchasing power, uh, that really puts an initiative into people to really uh, give it to the government about their policies. But of course, nobody ever takes on us, the United States, for all the things that we've done. There should have been boycott, divestment, and sanctions against the U.S. for Afghanistan, for Iraq, or all of these things, but no, uh, uh, nobody would do that. And yet, it was the the thing that would show the world to it would show to the United States and the U.S. government uh, what the world felt about these military operations that the U.S. has been doing. I mean, you have you have Ansar Allah in in uh, Yemen. I mean, they pretty much have a de facto uh, embargo on on Israel. 
uh, by stopping the uh, the ship going into the uh, Red Sea, uh, des- you know, destined to go to Israel. Um, so it's economically, uh, I've heard of a red report that is, it is taking its toll in Israeli economy, um, what Israel and Zerola is doing. Uh, but the same token, you know, you have um, Lloyd Austin pretty much, you know, putting together a quote unquote coalition of the willing, and you know, of of military assets go into the into the area to uh, to stop the uh, Anzurala from from affecting an embargo on 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 Israel. Seems like a uh, sanctions and embargo. It seems like a, you know, the West is the only one that they are allowed to do. So no one else can do that. Only we can do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll just mention I was in Istanbul about a month ago, and it was for the Gaza and trying to see what plans we might have to try to actually uh, challenge the continuing Israeli naval, naval blockade of, of Gaza. Uh, I, while we were there in Istanbul, the organizers uh, in Istanbul said to us who had come uh, from 10 different countries for this meeting, would you all like to fly out to Inserlik, to Adana, Turkey, out in the eastern side of Turkey, where there is a U.S. military base? And you you probably remember Inserlik from from being in the military. Well, it is a an air base that the U.S. is using to fly military equipment from Europe. Then they land at Inserlik, and then from Inserlik they go on into Israel because it's only like a thirty minute flight from Adana, Turkey, down to Tel Aviv. So the the groups, the Turkish groups we were with, said we're flying out to um, uh, to Inserlik. And we're going to have a big demonstration out there saying we don't want Turkish soil used to be able to transfer weapons into Israel. So there were thousands of Turkish citizens that had come by car from all over Turkey uh, to be a part of that demonstration. And then while we were there, we ended up uh, spending the night out at a warehouse area for one of the big Turkish NGOs that does a lot of work in northern Syria. There are so many refugee camps that are in northern Syria, and they were telling us that there are 28 U.S. military bases in northern Syria. I mean, these are small bases, but they are the U.S. footprint. And we know that there have been missile attacks on some of these bases since October 7th, uh, that uh, various groups are, are saying to the U.S. military, we don't like what you're doing in supporting Israel, we were all the way out there in Adana, Turkey. And then we asked, what is the feeling of the people around uh, the city of Adana? You've, we've gone out to the military base, and we don't like that base being used to transfer military weapons. And they said, well, it's really interesting because Israel has used the, the ports that are just south of Adana, Turkey, as one of the um, commercial um, ways that European, well, Turkish Turkish businessmen and commercial interests have had a large business with Israel. And so they, they were telling us, they said, uh, it's really difficult to get our own businessmen to boycott Israel now because this has been their lifeline for 20 years now. So it's it's a double-edged sword how all of this works on the sanctions and who is getting um, who's going to lose money if if products are sanctioned for for Israel. Yeah, and and on the sanctioning Israel, I mean the Trump administration called that the biggest diplomatic breakthrough is what they were doing with the Abraham Accords, right? And with yeah. the Abraham Accords, the Trump administration gave. Israeli, the Golden Heights, which is the Syrian territory. The achievement that Trump's talking about, the the uh, the Abraham Accord, it was to to all the Arab all the Arab states to make peace with Israel, as if they were at war with each other. They're not at war with each other, so why you have to make an accord to make peace with Israel, right? They already have trade with each other, right? So what was the purpose of the Abraham Accord? Some say that it was formalized it, and by doing so, it pretty much would bury the the Palestinian question forever. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I I think you're right. That was the purpose of it is trying to to bury the rights of the Palestinians. And another part of that also was uh, the the Trump family uh, uh, financial benefit from it 
where you have Jared Kushner, who now has a an equity firm with Saudi Arabia in the billions of dollars. Uh, so there was an economic benefit from uh, to going to some of Trump's uh, family and key advisors on this Abraham Accord. And of course, part of it was moving the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, something that was prohibited. I mean, that, that prohibited through the Oslo Accords, prohibited everywhere because it was a flashpoint in relations with uh, with the Palestinians and really with the rest of the Arab world. And Trump went ahead and did it and got away with it. So the, the Abraham Accords, I think, are in tatters now, and as, as they should be after what Israel has been doing uh, to the Palestinians. They never should have happened uh, because Israel has done nothing to to help the Palestinians. And instead, these accords were to essentially be a gift to Israel for its brutality for the on on the Palestinians, yeah, it would, it would it would condone and normalize uh, Israel's relationship with the Palestinians, you know, and it would yeah. be seen as business of usual. Yeah. So the accords, the more of them that are dumped until there is the recognition in Israel that their actions have to uh, show respect for the Palestinians, which will take you know fifty more years before they'll ever overcome the hole they've dug themselves in uh, in this 78-day uh, genocide that they've done on the Palestinians. And in fact, I don't think they'll ever be able to dig out of this hole. I think and they've created such a security nightmare for their own selves. It's a very dangerous thing that they've done for themselves and for for the United States. And do, you, do you think this, will, this action that they've taken will backfire on them? I mean, do you think the global majority will forget about this? I mean, the global majority is up in, you know, up in arms about this. They're not able to do anything more directly because they're not the means to, but the public opinion is enraged over what's happening right before our eyes. I believe being the first genocide or ethnic cleansing that, that has been done in broad daylight, you know, where everybody can see. But do, do you think there'll be, do you think this, they will have repercussion for the, for, for the United States uh, uh, based on what they're doing? Well, I certainly hope it has terrible repercussions for them. They should not be able to get away with this. I mean, there there have been some other genocides. I mean, you look what Milosevic did in the Muslim Serbs. Um, you look in Rwanda where two million uh, were killed in the, the genocide there. And people were held accountable afterwards. Um, so it is up to us to keep the pressure on. And it won't be through the U.S. government for sure, but it'll be through civil organizations which are already filing lawsuits in the International Criminal Court and the International Court of Justice uh, on the issue of Israeli actions in Gaza. So we have to keep supporting those organizations uh, and other, other and countries that are willing to step up and be a part of these lawsuits. You know, 155 countries uh, voted in the UN General Assembly for a ceasefire. Uh, in Gaza. So there are lots of countries that are so outraged about what Israel is doing. And I certainly hope uh, boycott and sanctions uh, happen to the state of Israel. They should be happening right now. It's funny you mentioned earlier about uh, sanctioning us. Symbols of America have been sanctioned. Uh, I, re I was reading about the terrible financial cost that McDonald's and, and Starbucks have been having because of this. Yeah. I mean, I read, some, I read that in some countries have been they've been yes. shutting down because of, of the people boycotting these businesses that symbols symbol that are symbol to America. And these corporations are trying to distance themselves from what the franchises in Israel have been doing, which is essentially giving away these products, McDonald's, hamburgers and and Starbucks coffee to the Israeli soldiers. And uh, the boycotts have been so strong, and in fact, they were going on in Turkey when I was there. Uh, Coca-Cola is another one that's boycott. There was a whole list of them. And as we would go into the markets uh, uh, and stop at places that uh, our Turkish friends would say, oh, you can't buy this. That's on the boycott list. You can't do this boycott. So things like uh, McDonald's and, and Starbucks have had to come out to say, listen, this is not us as an international policy. This is something that Israel did 
but don't take it out on us. But people are. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, uh, and I think there's a good place for us to wrap it up uh, for the day. Uh, thank you so much for coming onto the show and sharing your time with us, uh, your thoughts, your experiences. Uh, where can we find your work? Yeah, well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Uh, I do have a website. It's called VoicesOfConscience.com. And I list uh, the articles that I've written and the speaking engagements and things like that. Uh, I do a lot of uh, articles. In fact, I've just had one that has come out on Julian Assange uh, and a, a previous one that, of course, was on Gaza. Um, so all of those are listed on VoicesOfConscience.com. And uh, where can we find um, uh, information and actions or, or actions, you know, listeners should consider on the topics that we had today? Well, if you just Google um, uh, Palestinian protests in the United States, there are four or five different websites that will pop up that will have uh, listings state by state by state of, of things that are happening. So in your own community, you can find uh, uh, what's going on. Uh, Veterans for Peace, Code Pink Women for Peace, uh, Peace Action, all of these organizations have on their websites um, uh, actions that you can take and uh, petitions you can sign and uh, the telephone numbers of your congresspersons and the White House and the Department of Defense. So there's a lot of material out there uh, so that before you finish breakfast every day, please call your congresspeople, write them, email them. Uh, there's a lot we can do no matter where we are in, in our communities. Well, let me ask you something. Do you recommend writing an uh, email or, uh, you know, hand and paper? Uh, I think email's th certainly the easiest. And these are counted and they're printed out in the uh, congressional offices. That's one of the things that we ask the interns when we walk into an office. Have you been getting a lot of phone calls today on Gaza? Have you been getting a lot of emails? And we, we ask them, how many have you gotten? And they'll go to their list and tell you, well, today, so far, we've gotten 50 calls and we've gotten 15 emails. And uh, if if they get handwritten letters, they'll they'll say that. So they are supposed to be keeping count of it. And from what we see, they are. So um, it's whatever's the easiest. If it's easier for a person to write something and uh, handwrite it or type it up and then put it in an envelope and send it, Although it takes a long time to get through all of the security uh, parts of getting things to the White House and the and the Congress, so the emails go through fast, like instantly. And I I would recommend using that if people are comfortable with it. Yeah, it's just so disappointing getting those automated uh, emails back. <laughs> you know, and you oh, like did they even read it? <laughs> <laughs> well, they do, and at least somebody has gone through to at least figure out the topic that you had talked about and send you the form letter for that topic. So, <laughs> but then to call and see if you can't get uh, time with one of the staffers and develop a relationship with one of the, the foreign affairs staffers or the legislative aides uh, is, is hard to do, but it's worth it when you can, you can sometimes get somebody on the phone that'll talk to you. But then to make sure that you don't drone on forever, that you have a little elevator speech, two or three minutes long, and then then that's it. Because these folks definitely are very, very busy, and they don't have time for our, what we would like to do is a 20-minute oration on, on our feelings on whatever topic. And any last comments before we depart? Well, keep after them. Keep going. Uh, it's it's up to us as citizens to affect change in our own governments, and certainly uh, the fact that the United States uses uh, wars instead of uh, diplomacy is something we have to keep after them on. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us tonight, uh, and I hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Money is tight these days for everyone. Penny pinching to make it through the month often doesn't give people the funds to contribute to a creator they support. So we consider it the highest honor that 
folks help us fund the podcast in any dollar amount they're able. Patreons is the main place to do that. In addition, any support we receive makes sure we can continue to provide our main epistos free for everyone. And for supporters who can donate $10 a month or more, they will be listed right here as an honorary producer, like these fine folks. Fahim's Everyone Dream, Eric Phillips, Paul Appel, Julie Dupree, Thomas Benson, Janet Hansen, Ren Jacob, Scott Spaulding, Spooky Tooth, Helgeberg, and Howard Reynolds. However, if Patreon isn't your style, you can contribute directly through PayPal at paypal.me forward slash Fortress on a Hill. Or please check out our store on Spreadshirt for some great Fortress merch. We're on Twitter and on Facebook.com at Fortress on a Hill. You can find our full collection of episodes at www.fortressonahill.com. Skepticism is one's best armor. Never forget it. We'll see you next time. W.